talked about brain development, it's time for us to talk about sensation and perception over the lifespan. It's important to understand that at birth, perception is very different. And that's because of two main mechanisms. One is that our brain is not yet organized enough to really process everything. We're not as familiar with what's going on, so we don't have the neural pathways designed to help break down some of the things that we can be aware of, such as things as like envision lines and faces. So because of this, at birth, our neurons and our synapses are not yet organized to make sense of things the same way they would be in adulthood. Another major thing is that some of our senses are actually better at birth than they will be over the duration of the lifespan. And that's because instead of a use it or lose it, like with synaptogenesis, it's actually a use it and lose it. And that many of our senses become dulled over time as they get worn down over the lifespan. Now, how do we actually test what an infant can sense and perceive? It's hard because we can't give them surveys, we can't ask them. But one of the mechanisms we use is the mechanism of habituation. So habituation is when we determine if an infant notices a difference in two stimuli. And that lets us know if they can tell the difference between them, then they can see or hear or smell or taste a difference. For example, when it comes to something like vision, we may show a stimulus to an infant until they're bored with it. Let's say we're going to show them a red ball or a simple red square. We would hold this up, we would use eye tracking software, and we would see how long an infant would look at the red square or the red ball. Whenever the infant became bored with this red square, we would take it away, give them a rest period, and then show it to them again. Now, the second time we show them the red square, they will look at it, but for a shorter duration of time. Then when they get bored with it, we remove it a second time. We show it to them a third time. We show it to them a fourth, a fifth, a tenth time, until when we raise the red square or the red ball, they're barely looking at it because they've seen it enough already, they're pretty bored with it pretty quickly. At that point, that's considered habituation. The idea that they've now analyzed what the stimuli is and they don't need to look at it any further because their brain has said, okay, I get it. Once they're habituated to a red ball, a red square, anything, then we change the stimuli and we show them a blue ball or a blue square. And this is how we determine if they can tell the difference between red or blue. If they barely glance at the blue square, this tells us that they consider this to be pretty similar to the red square. And this lets us know that they can't really differentiate the difference. However, if after barely looking at the red square, they look longer at the blue square for the first time they see the blue one, this lets us know they can tell the difference between the blue and the red stimuli. Now for that example, I was using colors and I was using two colors that most people who are colorblind don't confuse. However, we tend to use much more subtle differences in the field. We might use things like two sounds, two tones on a piano. We might use colors that are very similar, or we might use shapes that are very similar to determine can an infant tell the difference between these two very similar stimuli. Habituation works not just with visual things, it can work with smells, it can work with taste, it can work with all kinds of auditory stimuli as well. So habituation is the main mechanism we use to test and see what an infant can perceive. Of course, once kids get older, we can just ask them and we can also use observations to see how they interact with different phenomena. So there's lots of different ways we get at this perception. And through this research on infant perception, we've noticed quite a few interesting things. For instance, when it comes to the chemical senses of smell and taste, these are best at birth. They're the best they're going to be in our lifespan. And what happens here is as we get more familiar with tastes and smells in the world around us, we also become a little bit numb to them. Infants are so good at smelling at birth that they can actually smell the difference and taste the difference between their birth mother's milk and another woman's breast milk. They can also smell the difference between the sweat from their birth mother's armpits versus their father's versus another woman's. And that's we simply put a little bit of a cotton swab in their armpit, get a little bit of body odor on it, and then we test habituation if they can tell the difference. And they'll prefer the breast milk and the armpit smell of their birth mother. And so this is really interesting how they have this, they can differentiate, but they also have this preference at birth. 
So they recognize the familiar smells of their birth mom, and they also prefer certain types of tastes. When it comes to tasting and putting things on the tongue, new newborn infants have a strong preference for sugary and sweet tastes, and they have a very strong preference away from bitter things and away from sour things. And what we know is actually some of the best things for infants at birth is very, very bland tastes tastes that are not very strong in the sour, sweet, salty, bitter phenomena whatsoever. And that's because at birth we have a hypersensitive tongue. All tastes are new to us, we weren't eating through the mouth in the womb, and so because of this, uh, our tongue responds very dramatically to very mild flavors. Compared to over the lifespan, eventually we're going to become more numb to this, and if we're eating really intense flavors that are found in artificially sweetened or artificially flavored junk foods, we might become numb to the beautiful flavors that exist in fresh produce, for example. That being said, through adulthood and into elderhood, we tend to retain most of our senses of flavor and smell, with the exception being if someone is a heavy smoker, that can often dull their senses. And if someone is experiencing something like COVID-19, we know that has dramatically removed people's senses of taste and sense of smell. Another sense that's very matured at birth is the sense of touch. And believe it or not, at one point in developmental psychology history, people wondered if infants even had a sense of touch at birth. We now know they definitely do. We now know that infants are born with lots of pain receptors. They definitely feel pain, they feel touch, and they also experience a high degree of digestive pain. That being said, when they're processing foods for the first time, solid foods or even breast milk the first time out of the womb, they're going to get a lot of digestive pains as they're building up those enzymes and they're building up the ability to process things. And so it's typical for infants to cry while they are experiencing gas, while they're digesting food, for instance. So they certainly feel pain at birth. In addition to pain, they also are sensitive to very light touches. Some light touches will send up a variety of newborn reflexes. Some of my favorites include the Babinski reflex. So the Babinski reflex is the idea that if you took a newborn's foot and not tickling, but just lightly took one finger and moved it upwards on the base of their foot, they will have an involuntary reflex in which their toes will fan out and just kind of spread out. Now, older kids and adults may voluntarily be able to make their toes spread out, but this is an involuntary reflex that the infant is not controlling. It's just going through their motor neurons and having this reaction. Another type of reflex that happens is the moral reflex. The moral reflex happens and is known as the sterile reflex when an infant experiences a sense of dropping. This can happen if they're nicely swaddled and they're being placed down in a bassinet or down in a crib. And what a moral reflex is, is they uh, spread their arms out, arch their back and cry. And so it's the idea that they might've been folded up really nice in a nice little blanket. And then when you set them down, their response is to open their arms, arch their back, and cry. And, and so the moral reflex can be uh, pretty annoying to the parents. They finally get the baby to sleep. But what happens is that they're setting them down too quickly. That sensation of gravity, it just makes them kind of alert themselves. And there's an evolutionary adaptation to this. It's they put their arms out and, and, and grab at things because they think they're falling. So it's, they're trying to grab at their caregiver. They're not, they're trying to prevent themselves from falling. Another type of reflex is the palmer reflex. And this is the idea that if anything gets placed in the palm of the hand on an infant, they will quickly close their fingers over it. This is really cute. You may have participated in this as an adult or a caregiver, where you just simply reach out with your index finger towards an infant. And it's just something amazing that when you get your little index finger in there, they close their hand over it. And this nice little baby handshake. Uh, this is something that you probably are pretty familiar with, but it's important to understand the infant has no control over this. This is just another evolutionary adapta adaptation that allows them to grasp on the things. And this has been used for lots of non-finger things such as hair or earrings or glasses, which may be more hazardous to the caregiver. We also know there is the rooting reflex. The rooting reflex is when something lightly touches the cheeks on an infant's face, they will turn their head in the direction of the cheek that was touched. So if the left cheek is stroked, they'll turn their head towards the left. If the right cheek is stroked, they'll turn the head towards the right. Again, I need to emphasize, although older infants and older children will certainly do this, if you touch someone, they'll turn towards you. This is involuntary. The infant has no control over this. So it's just a reflex they're hardwired with. And this is really important. This helps with the feeding process. If you're getting ready to, to feed an infant and the bottle or the breast touches one of their face, it allows them to turn into the nipple so they're able to feed. 
And speaking of feeding, then we have another really complex reflex known as sucking. And so sucking is very complicated. Older children who haven't been breastfed in many years or sipped in bottles many years, if they pick up a baby bottle and try to drink from it, they're actually gonna find it a little bit difficult now that they're used to sipping in a cup. But infants don't even have to think about it. Again, it's an involuntary reflex in which they're able to provide a suction around the nipple and make this vacuum at the back of the tongue with a really complex movement in their tongue to provide this suction effect. This, of course, is essential to the survival of our species. And when an infant doesn't have this second reflex or isn't able to latch on, we have to take a variety of other approaches to provide an intervention so that infant will be able to receive their nourishment. So the sense of touch is quite advanced at birth, and we know that touch is something that stays with us for the majority of the lifespan. Now, although smell, taste, and touch are pretty advanced at birth, the other senses, which tend to be more advanced in us in general, tend to be less matured at birth. For instance, our sense of hearing or auditory processing tends to start to develop around seven or eight months in gestation in the womb, but because there's so many low pitch noises in the womb, such as the parent's heartbeat, the parent's digestive juices, all kinds of other sounds, the offspring quickly learns to habituate to those and not pay attention to those low pitch noises. Instead, in the womb, the noises that are most interesting are the noises within the range of human vocalizations. So human speech becomes interesting. Because of this, we notice some really interesting effects in newborns. Newborns tend to be very attuned to the pitches that human speech falls in. They can pay attention and they can hear human speech at birth. They can also hear pitches that are slightly higher or higher pitched human voices they hear even better. However, low pitch noises such as a refrigerator or a loud garbage truck tends to not really affect them as much right when they're first born. As they get a couple months old, they will start to notice a difference. Because of this, we notice this when infants are sleeping, that loud but low pitch noises don't tend to disturb them as much as high pitch noises. So we often see this as the case. If one parent has very high pitched, perhaps more feminine voice, when they speak, the infant is more likely to wake up. Versus if another parent has a more low pitch or more masculine voice, they are less likely to wake up the infant. Which is why we often make the joke of speaking very lowly like this will not wake the baby. And so this has the counterpoint too. If we want to get the baby's attention, we can make very sweet high pitch voices and this will get the baby's attention. In addition to pitches, we also see that very early on in the lifespan, we become very interested in rhymes and melodies. This is why nursery rhymes tend to have a very rhythmic pattern, a very predictable sort of structure because infants enjoy that structure. They like repetitive melodies. And infants often enjoy hearing the same songs over and over and over again because the melody is predictable and the words become predictable and they really enjoy that. In addition, infants are actually at birth really good at locating sound. As good as they'll ever be as adults. We know there's diversity in this in adults. So this is the idea that if we place an infant down on a, on a bit of a little table or a bed and we had different speakers around them. We had, we had about seven different speakers, some to their right or their left or above them or at different angles. And one speaker played a melody or a tune. We can actually measure the infant's ability to detect where that sound is coming from based on where they turn their head. So this is something that seems to be set pretty early on in life and it's pretty stable. That being said, over the lifespan, our sense of hearing does change. Although in toddlerhood and early preschool childhood, we still prefer higher pitch voices because they sound happy and inviting. As we get older, we prefer people being a bit more serious with us. However, we do eventually experience deterioration and damage to our auditory processing. So between the ages of 19 and 66, we see a gradual increase in the amount of hearing loss experienced by adults. And this tends to happen more often in men than in women. Some of the reasoning for this may be that men historically have worked in louder industrial settings in the workplace, such as in factories or in construction. And what we know is with hearing, it's a use it then lose it phenomena. So the more you use your hearing, the more you're going to lose it. And so there are of course is individual differences and these are just averages, but on average, by the time we're 66, we can see that over half of men and women are experiencing some hearing loss and may begin to require the use of a hearing aid. And they tend to lose sensitivity to some pitches more than others. Some of the pitches they tend to lose sensitivity to are 
the more high pitched pitches rather than the low pitched pitches. And that's the way our ear is constructed. It's the idea that our ear will become more numb to high pitches first rather than low pitches.